Dead America. Tales from New York. The Subway. By Derek Slayton. Chapter 1. Day Zero Plus One. In the early hours of the morning, Harrison found himself in front of the bathroom mirror, the sun yet to grace the horizon with its presence. His reflection revealed the toll of an alarm that had rudely interrupted his sleep, leaving him with pronounced bags under his eyes. With a weary sigh, he splashed water on his face, a desperate attempt to rouse himself from the lingering grasp of slumber. Come on, man, he muttered to his reflection. I know it's early, but you really need to pull it together. Today is the day. You can do this. As he stared back at himself, the weariness began to fade, replaced by a glimmer of hope at the possibilities the day held. It had been three long months since he lost his job in finance, and the weight of unemployment had pressed heavily upon him. With his savings dwindling and bills mounting, he had sought solace in the bottom of a bottle, his days blurring together in a haze of numbing despair. But two days prior, a ray of hope had pierced through the darkness. An old friend from his previous job had secured him an interview with a different company, prompting Harrison to clean up his act. Forty-eight hours had passed without a drop of alcohol, and he had managed to establish a somewhat reasonable sleep schedule. However, the pre-dawn alarm had dealt a harsh blow to his newfound routine. You're going to nail the interview today and get back to living the high life, he affirmed to himself. As Harrison continued to scrutinize his reflection, Another sound pierced the stillness of the morning, a shrill alarm emanating from his phone. Glancing down, he noted the reminder flashing on the screen. Train, 20 minutes. Better get a move on then, he muttered, a sense of urgency creeping into his tone. Retreating into the cramped confines of his apartment's small bedroom, Harrison resumed his preparations. He retrieved his suit from the depths of the closet, where it had gathered a thin layer of dust during months of neglect. With hurried movements, he finished getting dressed just as his alarm chimed once more. Yeah, yeah, I'm going, he grumbled, silencing the persistent noise before slipping his phone into his pocket. Gathering his wallet, keys, and briefcase, he made his way out the door. As he traversed the hallway of his third-floor apartment, Harrison couldn't help but notice the absence of his usual companions on the morning commute. Typically, the corridor would be bustling with others making their way to the subway at this hour but today it was eerily deserted. His curiosity piqued. Harrison's attention was drawn to a door swinging open just as he reached the stairs. Startled, he turned to find a young man emerging, barely 20, clad in pajamas and emitting a series of coughs. Are you okay there? Harrison inquired, concern coloring his voice. Huh? Oh yeah, I'm just under the weather. That's all. The young man replied, his tone tinged with fatigue. Harrison instinctively took a step back, a cautious gesture that elicited a chuckle from the young man. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, the man replied. Trust me when I say that you don't want to catch whatever this is. It's knocked me on my ass. I don't suppose you'd give me a head start down the stairs, could you? I gotta catch the express so I can make my job interview, Harrison requested, a hint of urgency creeping into his tone. The man, though visibly unwell, smiled faintly as he stifled another cough, motioning for Harrison to pass. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to be hurting for hours, so another 30 seconds isn't going to matter, he conceded, his voice strained with fatigue. I appreciate it. Hope you get to feeling better, Harrison remarked sincerely. Thanks. Hope your interview goes well, the man replied, offering a nod of acknowledgement before succumbing to another fit of coughing. With a quick nod in return, Harrison hastened past him, descending the stairs in a flurry of motion before hitting the streets outside. Much like the deserted corridors of his apartment building, the streets were unusually quiet for this time of day. A few passing cars and scattered pedestrians were the only signs of life in the pre-dawn stillness. I guess that cold is hitting a lot of people hard, Harrison mused aloud, his words echoing softly in the serene morning air. Harrison brushed off the lingering thoughts as he set off towards the subway station, just a few blocks away. As he reached the stairs leading underground, a couple of fellow commuters joined him. Austin, a seasoned businessman in his fifties, exuded sophistication in his meticulously tailored suit, his balding head reflecting the dim light of the early morning. Fran, in her thirties, 
radiated professionalism in her power suit, her dirty blonde hair pulled back neatly, and her briefcase exuded an air of authority. Acknowledging them with a polite nod, Harrison descended to the platform alongside them, where a few more individuals had gathered. Grant, a young man in his 20s, sported a disheveled appearance in jeans and a sweatshirt, his exhaustion palpable. Eden, a striking 23-year-old artist, clutched her sketchbook and colored pencils tightly, her attention absorbed by the music flowing through her headphones. As the group stood in relative silence, awaiting the arrival of the train, Harrison couldn't help but notice Grant's precarious stance, teetering on the brink of exhaustion. Hey buddy, Harrison addressed him gently. I'm not trying to be rude, I swear. But if you're feeling under the weather, would you mind taking a few steps in the other direction? Grant's response was tinged with a hint of hostility. Relax, suit. I'm not sick, just had a late night, that's all. You don't have to worry about missing your precious board meetings or whatever the hell it is that you do. My apologies, Harrison replied evenly, unfazed by Grant's brusque demeanor. My neighbor was sick, and with the sparse crowd here, it seems there's something going around. Yeah, well, whatever it is, I don't have it, Grant retorted curtly. Good to know, Harrison conceded with a nod. Grant remained silent, his focus solely on maintaining his balance as he battled the exhaustion threatening to overwhelm him. Sensing his discomfort, Harrison reached into his briefcase, retrieving an energy bar, and extended it towards him in a gesture of goodwill. What the hell is this? Grant asked, confusion evident in his voice. I've been unemployed for the last few months, so believe me when I say that I know a hangover when I see one. These things helped ease the pain, Harrison explained, his tone sympathetic. After a moment of consideration, Grant nodded and accepted the energy bar. I appreciate it. I'm sorry if I came off a little harsh there. I've only been up about 15 minutes. One of those nights, huh? Harrison remarked, understanding dawning in his expression. Yeah, for some reason I thought letting my buddy set me up on a blind date would go well, Grant confessed, a hint of self-deprecation in his tone. You're still wearing the same clothes from last night, so it can't be all bad, Harrison remarked with a lighthearted chuckle. Grant chuckled as he took a bite of the energy bar, savoring the momentary respite from his discomfort. After a brief pause to chew, he resumed the conversation, his attention drawn to a newcomer passing through the turnstile. Well, my buddy said she lived in Queens but forgot to mention that it was the ass end of Queens. But I already said yes before a 45-minute train ride, Grant lamented, a tinge of regret coloring his words. At least we have the express train. Couple stops after this one, and then it's smooth sailing, Harrison offered optimistically, attempting to inject a note of encouragement. It's still longer than I'd like to spend on a train for a dinner date, Grant remarked with a sigh. Yeah, but you're still here in the morning, so... Harrison trailed off, expecting Grant to elaborate on the evening's events. However, Grant burst into laughter, catching Harrison off guard. I know what you're implying, and I wish it was that good. But it was a disaster, Grant confessed, his amusement mingling with chagrin. I've had some disasters in my time. How bad was it? Harrison inquired, genuine curiosity coloring his tone. Well, for starters, she was a professional alcoholic. When she ordered a bottle of wine at dinner, then turned and asked me what I wanted to drink. I knew I was in trouble, Grant recounted with a wince. Ouch, Harrison sympathized, his expression reflecting a mixture of empathy and amusement. Yeah, it only went downhill from there. I'll spare you the gory details, but let's just say that I'm banned from that restaurant and the waiter got a big tip to go along with some money for dry cleaning, Grant concluded with a shake of his head, the memory still fresh in his mind. Harrison couldn't help but release a horrified laugh at Grant's misadventures, his mirth infectious as Grant joined in. So yeah, me being the gentleman that I am, and not wanting to hear about it from my buddy, I escorted her back to her apartment. By the time I got her there, the express wasn't running anymore, so I took a nap on the couch, Grant recounted with a rueful shake of his head. Yeah, that's a rough one, man, Harrison commiserated. It's Grant, Grant corrected with a chuckle, extending his hand, which Harrison shook. Harrison, he introduced himself with a nod. Grant gestured to the remnants of the energy bar before offering a grateful smile and nod, and I do appreciate the pick-me-up. Not sure I'd survive the ride without it. 
Before Harrison could respond, the train began to approach the station, drowning out their conversation with its rumbling noise. They fell silent as they waited for the train to come to a stop, the anticipation palpable. As they settled into their seats and the train started to move, a sudden commotion drew their attention. Screams echoed from the top of the platform stairs, prompting everyone in the vicinity to stand and turn towards the source. The tension on the platform escalated as the young woman in the business suit made a desperate bid to escape her pursuer. With a swift motion, she hurled her briefcase back towards the figure chasing her, buying herself precious seconds. Struggling to swipe her card through the turnstile, panic etched on her features, she barely managed to clear it before her assailant closed in. But to her dismay, her frantic efforts left the turnstile unlatched, allowing the ominous figure to slip through behind her. A guttural cry escaped her lips as the entity lunged towards her, but she deftly evaded its grasp, flinging it aside before sprinting towards the waiting train with all the strength she could muster. With a mere ten yards between her and safety, the train's doors chimed ominously, signaling their imminent closure. A terrified scream tore from her throat as she hurtled towards them, trying desperately to get there before they closed. Meanwhile, the last man to join the group on the platform sprang into action, rushing to a nearby door and thrusting his hands into the narrow gap, determined to pry them open by any means necessary. Inside the train car, the passengers stood frozen in terror as they witnessed the harrowing scene unfolding on the platform. The creature pursuing the woman closed in on her as she desperately pounded on the closed door, her panicked pleas echoing in the confines of the train. With a sickening lurch, the creature sank its teeth into her neck, eliciting a horrified gasp from everyone inside as a spray of blood splattered across the window. Shocked and appalled, they recoiled from the gruesome sight, their expressions a tableau of fear and disbelief. While this was happening, the man struggled against the stubborn door, his efforts finally rewarded as it swung open, allowing him to rush out onto the platform. As the door began to close again, trapping the remaining passengers inside, they watched as the man confronted the creature that had attacked the woman. With a sharp whistle, he attempted to draw the creature's attention, but before he could taunt it, the ghoul turned its focus towards him, sprinting forward with alarming speed. Caught off guard, the man braced himself, summoning all his courage as the creature hurtled towards him. In a desperate bid to defend himself, he deflected the ghoul's charge, sending it crashing to the ground in a flurry of motion. But the creature wasted no time in regaining its footing, its relentless advance unfazed by the setback, as it closed in on the brave man who stood defiantly in its path. As the man grappled with the relentless creature, his futile attempts to subdue it met with little success. Despite his relentless barrage of blows, the creature remained undeterred, its frenzied movements becoming increasingly desperate as it sought to sink its teeth into its adversary. Inside the train, the passengers grew increasingly frantic as they watched the unfolding chaos on the platform. With the train slowly gaining momentum, a sense of urgency swept over them, prompting a few individuals to pound on the windows in a desperate attempt to get the man's attention. But their efforts went unnoticed, the man wholly consumed by his struggle against the creature. Suddenly, to the horror of everyone inside the train, the woman who had been attacked began to stir, her movements sluggish and disoriented at first. But as her gaze swept across the platform, confusion gave way to an intense focus, and without hesitation, she launched herself towards the man who had come to her aid. As the train delved deeper into the tunnel, the passengers could only watch as the woman tackled the man from behind, her teeth sinking into his shoulder with savage intensity. The group stood in stunned silence for a moment, the gravity of the situation sinking in. Then, in a voice trembling with fear and disbelief, Fran spoke up, her words echoing through the car with a near screaming urgency. What in the hell is going on? Chapter 2 The subway car rattled along its tracks, the ambient hum of the train filling the air. Inside, the group of five individuals sat in stunned silence, their minds grappling with the unsettling scene they had just witnessed. Harrison, positioned by the window, found his gaze drawn to the blood stain slowly trickling down the glass. After a prolonged silence, Austin broke the tension with a bewildered question. Maybe I just haven't had enough coffee this morning, but did that man bite the woman? Or am I just seeing things? Grant's response was swift and matter-of-fact. You ain't seeing things, buddy. 
that guy just ran up and took a chunk out of her like he was a homeless man at a buffet. Eden interjected, her tone skeptical. Like a homeless man at a buffet? Really? Grant shrugged dismissively. Whatever, you get the point. Did anybody else see her get up and attack that guy who tried to help? Harrison asked. The group fell into a contemplative silence, each one reflecting on the disturbing events they had just observed. Eventually, Fran tentatively suggested, maybe it wasn't that bad of an injury? Grant scoffed incredulously. Not that bad of an injury? Just look at how much blood is still on the window. I've donated less than that, and let me tell you, I wasn't doing wind sprints 30 seconds afterwards either. Harrison chimed in, his voice tinged with concern. Plus, she attacked the guy who tried to help. So what are you saying? Austin asked. Harrison's response was grave. I'm saying that something weird is going on, and we have about seven minutes before we're at the next station to figure it out. What happens at the next station? Eden asked. Austin's reply was terse, carrying a sense of foreboding. Shit. Eden's panic escalated as Austin's words sank in. What happens at the next station? She blurted out. Austin's expression was grave. If that wasn't an isolated incident, then there may be trouble at the next station. So just call up the conductor and tell them to stop the train. Eden suggested frantically. Harrison intervened, his tone tense. We can't. The express train is automated, so it's going to make the stops regardless of what is going on outside. Eden's desperation grew. So what do we do? Just sit here and wait until we roll to our deaths. We make calls. See if anybody out there knows what's going on, Austin proposed, trying to maintain composure amidst the mounting tension. That's a great idea, except for the fact that we're underground, Grant pointed out. In another minute, we won't be. This train hits the surface for three minutes. That will give us time to call and see what we can find out, Austin explained. So where do we call? Grant inquired. Harrison singled out Austin and Fran. You two, in the suits. Austin and Fran both acknowledged with their names as Harrison gestured towards them. I'm Harrison, that's Grant. Now I'm assuming that you two work in Manhattan? Harrison asked. Both Austin and Fran nodded in affirmation. Okay, call whoever you can there to find out what the situation there is. Given how we're headed there, Harrison instructed, his voice commanding yet tinged with apprehension. I got people there too, I'll see who I can get a hold of. Grant offered. I know some people around Queens, I'll see if I can get any of them. We have two more stops, so if it's clear here, then we may want to get off while we have the chance, Harrison said. Harrison noticed Eden's lingering fear and approached her, his hand gently resting on her shoulder to draw her attention. It's going to be okay. What's your name? He asked, his voice soothing. I'm Eden she replied, her voice trembling slightly. Oh, Caden, where can you call? Are you in Queens? Manhattan? Harrison inquired. My mom is home in Queens. I, I can call her. She's been sick though, so she might not answer, Eden confessed, her worry evident in her tone. It's okay, just try. That's all we can do, Harrison reassured her, offering a supportive nod. Eden retrieved her phone along with everyone else, their collective gaze fixed on the bars indicating their reception as they approached the tunnel's end. Fingers poised above the dial button, they waited in tense anticipation for the first rays of sunlight to penetrate the subway car, bringing with them the much-needed signal. As light flooded the car, each person pressed the dial button simultaneously, their hopes riding on the connection. Harrison dialed the corner store just up from his apartment. Despite living in the same apartment for three years, the shop owner was the only person who knew his name. Come on, come on, answer, he muttered under his breath. After several rings, the phone was finally answered, but instead of the customary greeting, there was only a scared whisper that Harrison strained to make out. Hello? Can you hear me? He called into the receiver. Please help me. I don't know what to do, came the frightened plea from the other end. Harrison listened intently, 
but the voice remained ambiguous, lacking any distinguishing characteristics of gender or age. Tell me what's wrong, he urged, his heart pounding with apprehension. Somebody. Somebody attacked the owner. I don't think he's going to make it, the voice revealed, trembling with fear. What happened? Was he bitten? Harrison questioned. Yeah, he was. How did you know? The voice responded. Listen to me. You need to lock the door and get away from him. Do you understand? Harrison instructed, his voice firm with conviction. What are you talking about? We have the doors locked because crazy people are trying to get in. But why do we have to get away from him? The voice questioned. Just trust me, do it now, Harrison insisted. Harrison listened helplessly as the person on the other end set the phone down, the distant murmur of conversation giving way to piercing screams. His stomach churned with dread as the chaos unfolded, the sounds of yelling and crashing objects echoing through the phone line. Unable to intervene, Harrison could only lower his phone to his side, exhaling a heavy sigh of frustration. Glancing around the subway car, he saw mirrored expressions of concern and distress etched on the faces of his companions. Fran and Austin were frantically dialing numbers, their desperation palpable as they sought any semblance of connection. Meanwhile, Grant's conversation with someone seemed to yield little comfort. Meeting Harrison's gaze, Grant shook his head in silent acknowledgement of the grim reality he faced on the other end of the line. Turning his attention to Eden, who sat sobbing with the phone pressed to her ear, Harrison made his way over and took a seat beside her. Are you okay, Eden? He asked softly, his voice infused with genuine concern. Harrison accepted the phone from Eden, his heart sinking as he brought it to his ear, only to be greeted by the haunting sounds of moans and footsteps. With each word he spoke, the moaning intensified, culminating in a loud, jarring clang as if the phone had been struck. Who was that? He asked, his voice strained with dread. It was my mother. She's been sick for the last few days, but made me promise I would go to Central Park today and do my drawings, Eden explained between sobs, her grief evident in her trembling voice. I wanted to stay home and take care of her, but she insisted. And now I. Eden faltered, her emotions overwhelming her momentarily before she gathered herself enough to continue. I think she might be gone, she finally confessed, her words heavy with the weight of realization. Feeling overwhelmed by the flood of emotions, Harrison instinctively wrapped his arm around Eden, offering what little comfort he could. The weight of the situation pressed heavily on him, the onslaught of bad news leaving him at a loss for words. He couldn't bring himself to falsely reassure Eden about her mother's condition, knowing deep down that she was most likely gone. As the train descended into the next tunnel, plunging the subway car into darkness save for the interior lights, Austin and Fran expressed their frustration by setting down their phones in defeat. What did you find out? Harrison inquired. Nobody is answering in my office. I tried the main line, then half a dozen people directly. These people are dedicated to their jobs, so at least one of them should have picked up, Austin reported. Fran, what about you? Harrison asked. Mostly the same. Somebody did pick up one of the calls, but they didn't sound right. Fran replied. What do you mean they didn't sound right? Harrison pressed, a sinking feeling gnawing at his gut. They were just grunting or moaning or something. No words, just sounds, Fran elaborated. Harrison exchanged a worried glance with Eden, offering her a reassuring pat on the shoulder before rising to his feet. Eden heard the same thing on her call. Harrison informed the group. What about you? Were you able to get a hold of anybody? Austin inquired. Yeah, the store just around the corner from my apartment. Somebody attacked the store owner, and it sounded just like what happened to the woman on that platform. But that wasn't the worst of it, Harrison revealed, his voice heavy with foreboding. Well, don't keep us in suspense, Fran urged. It sounded like there were several of those crazy people outside the store, too. And the shop owner who got bitten? He got up, too, Harrison said. Austin and Fran's heads drooped in defeat. Eventually, all eyes turned to Grant, who simply shook his head in dismay. What did you find out? Austin finally voiced the question hanging heavy in the air. That Manhattan is a war zone, Grant replied solemnly, 
his words casting a chilling silence over the group. What do you mean a war zone? Fran pressed. One of my friends works down in Times Square, and I managed to get a hold of them. And it's bad, Grant elaborated. Okay, it's bad. How bad? Fran probed further. They said that the attack began sometime overnight. He was working the late shift at the store and was about to lock up when all hell broke loose. People getting bitten, then getting back up again. I mean, if I hadn't seen it happen with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it, Grant recounted. He let out a bitter laugh. Shaking his head before continuing, he said that he managed to get up to the storage room upstairs, which had a window overlooking the street. There are thousands of those things out there. A shiver ran through the subway car. The weight of Grant's words sinking in as the rhythmic motion of the train continued unabated. After several moments of heavy silence, Harrison broke the tension. Okay, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting off at the next stop, he declared. How do you know it's safe out there? Fran questioned. Oh, I'm pretty confident that it's not. But when we were on the surface, I looked out and you know what I didn't see? Thousands of those things packing the streets. So I'd rather take my chances out here than in Manhattan, Harrison reasoned. The others exchanged silent glances, a consensus forming among them as they nodded in agreement. But what are we going to do once we get out of here? Where are we going to go? Eden interjected, her voice trembling with fear. I'm going to find some place with food, lock it up tight, and wait for someone to come save the day, Harrison replied, his tone resolute. But what if they don't come? Eden pressed, her anxiety mounting. Then at least I'm going to eat well for a few weeks, Harrison quipped. But, Eden attempted to voice her concerns, only to be cut off by Fran. He's right, it doesn't matter what happens next if we don't get through the day today. We find some place with food and hold up as long as we can, Fran asserted. Yeah, sure, what the hell. I'm in. Sounds a lot better than spending my day on a conference call with investors in Germany, Austin chimed in, his tone resigned yet oddly relieved. Harrison turned to Grant, seeking his agreement. Hey, I got no place else to be, Grant replied with a shrug. As Harrison glanced over at Eden, still consumed by her tears, she managed to give him a nod and a thumbs up. Okay, we have a plan, or at least the beginnings of one. I don't suppose anybody has any weapons, do they? Harrison inquired. Everyone shook their heads while the two business people held up their briefcases. Eden rummaged through her bag, producing a pair of scissors and a bundle of colored pencils. Well, we're not exactly equipped for a big fight, but at least it's something, Harrison remarked with a grim smile. Just then, they felt the train begin to decelerate, followed by a ding on the intercom. The automated voice announced their arrival at the next station. As they pulled into the station, they all peered anxiously through the windows at the platform, Harrison voicing what each of them were thinking. Oh my God. Chapter 3 The group's horrified gaze fixated on the platform as the subway car eased to a stop. There, standing ominously, were several dozen zombies, their attention drawn by the arrival of the noisy train. With a sinking feeling, the passengers listened to the relentless pounding of the undead against the windows and doors as the train rolled past. Helplessness settled over them as the grotesque parade of creatures shuffled by outside, illuminated by the train's lights. Block the doors. Harrison yelled out. Responding swiftly, Harrison and Grant sprang into action, securing the left door while Fran and Austin positioned themselves at the right, using their briefcases as makeshift shields. These doors open for 60 seconds, Harrison called out, his tone firm. As soon as you hear the ding, make sure the doorway is clear. The four of them stood frozen, eyes wide with terror, as they beheld the horde of creatures spreading across the platform, pressing against the train like a wave crashing against a shore. With a sudden jolt, the train screeched to a halt, accompanied by a ding from the intercom. In the heartbeat that followed, the doors slid open, revealing the nightmare awaiting them. Harrison's scream pierced the air as he clenched the handle of his briefcase, thrusting it forward into the chest of the first zombie attempting to board. Grant joined the fray, seizing hold of another zombie's arm, struggling against its relentless advance. The creatures writhed and twisted, 
their collective effort to breach the threshold thwarted by Harrison and Grant's resistance. Despite the burning strain in his muscles, Harrison glanced to his left, observing with dread the sight of more zombies rushing into the adjacent car. Eden, he shouted, urgency lacing his voice. Lock the doors. Eden's heart raced as Harrison's urgent cry pierced the chaos around her. With dread pooling in her gut, she glanced toward the adjacent train car, where a swarm of zombies poured in like a flood. Panic seized her, propelling her from her seat in a frenzied scramble toward the door. Though no lock adorned it, she improvised, hastily looping her bag around the door release and a nearby metal fixture. With trembling hands, she secured the door as best she could, her breath coming in ragged gasps as she watched the zombies in the adjoining car pound against the glass with frenetic desperation, their hollow eyes fixed on their potential prey. For a fleeting moment, she stood frozen, the reality of their peril sinking in. Then, with a jolt, she spun around, her gaze landing on another door at the opposite end of the train car. Without hesitation, she dashed back across the carriage, past her companions who valiantly fought to hold the line against the encroaching horde. As she hurried, Eden snatched Fran's purse from where it lay forgotten on a nearby seat, repurposing it to secure the second door. With a swift motion, she wedged it between the door handle and a protruding metal fixture, ensuring another barrier against the encroaching threat. Her eyes flicked back to the zombies in the adjacent car, noting with a mix of relief and dread that they remained fixated on the glass, their agitation palpable as they pounded against the windows without attempting to breach the door. As the group fought against the undead, the echoing ding of the intercom pierced through the battle, signaling the impending closure of the doors. When I say now, you shove him with everything you have. Harrison's voice cut through the tension, his instructions met with a firm nod of understanding from Grant. With nerves taut like drawn bowstrings, Harrison mentally counted down the seconds between the ding and the commencement of the door closure. Do it now. He commanded, his voice a sharp bark as the moment arrived. With a concerted effort, Harrison and Grant pushed with all their might, driving the large zombie backward until it lost its footing, tumbling out of the train car in a chaotic flurry. As it fell, it instinctively latched onto nearby creatures, inadvertently dragging them away from the door's threshold, affording them a crucial moment to slam the door shut. Need some help over here. Austin's voice rang out, drawing Harrison and Grant's attention to the other door where Austin and Fran struggled against two smaller creatures attempting to force their way inside. Rushing to assist, Harrison joined Austin in pushing back one of the creatures, sending it crashing to the ground. Meanwhile, Fran grappled desperately with the other, her efforts staving off the impending breach. But as one side of the door was cleared, it began to close, threatening to remain open due to the zombie still in the threshold. Acting swiftly, Harrison reached past Fran, seizing the creature's arm and wrenching it into the train car just as the door began to close. With a forceful shove, he sent the creature sprawling to the floor, where it thrashed and writhed in frustrated fury. Oh my God. Oh my God. Fran yelled in a panic. Harrison stood his ground, flanked by Grant and Austin. Before he could utter a word, the creature surged forward with renewed ferocity, barreling toward him with reckless abandon. Reacting swiftly, Austin swung his briefcase like a makeshift club, connecting solidly with the creature's shoulder and sending it careening down the aisle. Seizing the opportunity, Harrison darted behind the stumbling creature, grasping the back of its shirt in a vice-like grip. With practiced efficiency, he entwined his leg around the zombies, leveraging their combined weight to bring them crashing to the floor in a thunderous collision. The creature's face met the unforgiving surface with a sickening thud, momentarily stunned by the force of the impact. As it writhed and struggled beneath him, Harrison's voice cut through the clamor, sharp and urgent. Somebody hit it with something, he shouted. Grant seized one of the briefcases, leaping over several seats with agility to reach the other side. With a swift, powerful motion, he brought the briefcase down with forceful precision onto the creature's skull, each blow resounding with sickening impact until they heard the ominous crack of bone. Like a switch being flipped, the creature's movements ceased abruptly its lifeless form sprawled on the floor. Harrison maintained his tight grip on the ghoul, reluctance gnawing at him as he cautiously released his hold and rose to his feet, poised to react at the slightest hint of resurgence. Are we good? I think we're good, he ventured cautiously. 
Grant stood grimly, blood staining the briefcase he held aloft, his readiness to strike again evident despite the now motionless creature before them. With a heavy exhale, he relinquished the briefcase, sinking into a nearby seat with weary exhaustion. How long do we have before the next stop? Grant inquired. Ten minutes, Harrison replied, his tone tinged with resignation. I thought this thing was the express. Why are we making so many stops? Grant questioned. We're at the end of the track out here, so it's three stops, then all the way to the river for one more, then the final one in Manhattan, Austin explained. Fantastic. I don't know about the rest of you, but I really don't want to get out in that mess, Grant muttered bitterly. Hate to break it to you, buddy, but you're already out in that mess, Austin retorted dryly. Grant pondered the situation for a moment before a chuckle escaped him. So we're still getting off at the next stop, right? Eden asked. If it's anything like that platform, then we're not going to get off of it, let alone find someplace safe, Fran interjected. But we have to try, don't we? Eden's plea hung in the air. Austin nodded in agreement. Fran's right. If we get off in the middle of Queens, we're signing our own death warrant. There's no way we're going to be able to get to a store. Even if we did, it's a safe bet that it's already locked up tight. And to be frank, I wouldn't open those doors for anything, let alone strangers, Grant added. Eden's frustration bubbled to the surface. Well then what do we do? We can't just sit here and do nothing. Austin's voice cut through the mounting tension. The kid's right, we do need a plan. And we have about seven minutes to come up with one, Fran added. Harrison paused, deep in thought, before making his way to the door leading to the next train car. Peering inside, he observed the relentless creatures pounding against the glass. With a heavy heart, he leaned his forehead against the cold surface, a sigh escaping him as he contemplated their dwindling options. I know we just met and all, but I totally recognize that expression. You're about to suggest something stupid, aren't you? Grant's dry humor cut through the solemn atmosphere, drawing a faint smile from Harrison despite the situation. I'm afraid so, but I don't see another way, Harrison admitted ruefully. What are you thinking? Fran inquired. I'm thinking that when we stop at the next platform, a couple of us are going to try and get to the front car, Harrison revealed, his gaze steady as he met their questioning stares. Why? What good would that do? Austin interjected. If we can get into the control room, we might be able to stop the train, Harrison explained. I thought this thing was automated? Grant interjected, echoing Austin's doubt. It is, but they still have a control room. I'm hoping there's a way for us to stop it, Harrison clarified. But even if we stop it, what good is that going to do? We're still going to be in the middle of one of the most populated areas on the planet, Fran pointed out. I'm hoping I can stop it while we're under the river, Harrison said. As Harrison's bold proposal hung in the air, the group's initial incredulity staring back at him. Harrison's smile widened at their stunned reactions, acknowledging the skepticism with a wry nod. Yeah, that was the reaction I thought I was going to get, he quipped. It took a moment, but Grant's skepticism melted into reluctant approval, a smile spreading across his face as he slapped Harrison on the back. That's a hell of an idea, Harrison, Grant conceded. Fran, however, remained skeptical, her skepticism cutting through the tentative optimism. I'm glad you think so, but would you mind sharing with the rest of us? Because we all think you're stupid as hell, she challenged. Harrison proceeded to lay out his rationale, his confidence unwavering despite their doubts. The subway runs underneath the river, and thanks to robust safety regulations, there has to be an emergency exit in the tunnel, Harrison explained. Where the hell would that even lead to? Austin interjected. Roosevelt Island would be my guess. It's still going to be populated, but nowhere near as much as Queens, and certainly nowhere close to Manhattan. We might be able to find some place to hide, or be close enough to the water to reach it, Harrison elaborated. What are we going to do if we go to the water? Eden questioned. Ideally find a boat and hope that whatever those things are can't swim, Grant suggested. 
As the group mulled over their options, Austin and Fran exchanged a glance, a silent acknowledgement passing between them. Well, it's not the worst idea I've heard today, Austin admitted reluctantly. The question is, who is going to make a run for the front? Fran asked. Harrison's sly smile prompted Grant to release a resigned sigh, shaking his head in mock exasperation. I just had to start up a conversation with you, didn't I? Grant quipped. Nah, it's not that. I just figured that since I fed you breakfast you'd have enough energy to make the run with me, Harrison retorted playfully, a mischievous glint in his eyes. Grant chuckled, his laughter tinged with a hint of apprehension. Yeah, sure, why not? What do I have to lose? Okay, we're going to make a run for it while you three hold down the fort here. Do you think you can keep those things out of the car here? Harrison addressed the remaining trio. I think with you two making a run for it, you'll be drawing all of the attention, Austin remarked. Gotta love being popular, Harrison quipped. He tossed his briefcase to Grant, who caught it deftly. Does that work for you? Harrison inquired, his eyes locking with Grant's. Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable swinging this. What are you going to use? Grant questioned. Harrison approached Eden, who sat beside her belongings on the seat. Do you still have that pair of scissors? He asked. Eden nodded, passing the scissors to him. I just sharpened them last night, so you should be able to cut pretty well with it, she offered. Thank you, Eden. I'll do my best to get them back to you in one piece, Harrison promised. It's okay, really. I don't think they're going to cut so well once they've stabbed someone, Eden replied dryly. Harrison chuckled at Eden's grim humor before nodding in agreement. Okay, when this train stops, we're going to make a run for it. There's a good half hour between this and the next to last stop, so we'll have some time to work, Harrison said. And if any of those things get in here, try crushing their head. That seemed to work really well for this guy, Grant added, punctuating his words with a kick directed at the lifeless zombie on the subway car floor. Okay, let's get ready to do this. Chapter 4 Tension gripped the group as the train decelerated. Harrison and Grant positioned themselves by the foremost door, Austin poised behind, primed to protect it from zombies. On the opposite side, Fran and Eden, though visibly uncertain, steeled themselves for their roles, aware they had no alternative. Okay, we have 60 seconds from the time the doors open to when they shut again, Harrison delineated. We get as far up the line as we can, but as soon as you hear that ding, you dive into a car. What if there are those things in there? Grant interjected. Then it's been fun knowing you, Harrison responded dryly, prompting a less than enthusiastic reaction from Grant. Not exactly the answer I was looking for, Grant retorted. We're just going to have to hope that there aren't too many of them, Harrison reasoned. If crushing their heads worked, we can only hope that stabbing them works too. Well, you got the blade? I'll knock them down, you finish them off, Grant proposed. Don't be afraid to crack a few skulls too, Harrison added. Grant's chuckle of agreement echoed through the tense air as the train glided into the station. Both men shared a moment of relief, noting the comparative emptiness of the platform compared to the last stop. Nonetheless, their attention was drawn to the dozen or so figures on the platform, their focus fixed on the approaching train. As the ding sliced through the anticipation, Harrison and Grant stiffened, preparing for the imminent opening of the doors. With a crack, the door yielded, revealing a charging creature. Grant sprang forward, the briefcase positioned as a makeshift shield. With a forceful thrust, he drove his shoulder into the creature, the impact sending it sprawling to the ground. Harrison swiftly followed, veering towards the train's front where four more cars lay between them and the control room. Racing alongside the subway, his focus shifted as he noticed zombies within the adjacent car matching his pace. Damn it. Move away from the train. Harrison's command rang out, urgency lacing his tone. Meanwhile, Grant reacting to Harrison's shout, swung his briefcase at a sprinting creature, connecting with its arm. The blow threw the creature off balance, sending it crashing to the ground as Grant glanced up to discern the cause of Harrison's outcry. 
Grant complied with Harrison's directive, veering a few yards away from the train while maintaining their forward momentum. Together, they pressed on, their feet pounding against the platform as they shoved zombies aside in their path. Approaching the opening of the first car, Harrison seized an opportunity, snatching a zombie hurtling towards him from the opposite direction. With a deft maneuver, he redirected its momentum, hurling it into the car's interior, causing a domino effect that sent several creatures sprawling to the ground. As they advanced to the front of the following car, a swarm of zombies surged forth from its entrance. With limited options, Harrison resorted to brute force, lowering his shoulder and plowing through the oncoming horde. As Harrison regained his footing, the relentless advance of the creatures bore down upon him. With a surge of desperation, he attempted to rise, only to be hindered by the onslaught. Just as one of the creatures closed in, poised to strike, Grant intervened with swift action. Rushing forward, he intercepted the creature, swiftly incapacitating it with a well-executed maneuver, buying Harrison precious moments to recover. Scrambling to his feet, Harrison hastily rejoined Grant in their frenzied flight, the relentless pursuit of the ghoulish horde close behind. With each passing moment, the mob swelled in size. Approaching the next car, Harrison quickly assessed the situation within, noticing that only a few creatures were inside. Follow me he commanded. Harrison and Grant burst through the door, their focus fixed on the path ahead as they surged towards the front of the car. The presence of the two zombies within drew their attention, prompting Harrison's decisive command. Plow through them. Harrison urged. Responding without hesitation, Grant took the lead, using the briefcase as a makeshift shield as he barreled into the first creature. The impact was forceful enough to send the creature sprawling to the ground, allowing both of them to leap over it. But their progress was impeded by the second creature. Grant attempted a similar tactic, only to encounter unexpected resistance as the creature seized hold of the briefcase in its fall, wrenching it from Grant's grip. Harrison grabbed the case as they kept moving, knowing that if they were going to have a chance at survival that they were going to need weapons. As they neared the front of the car, with the platform door just a couple of steps away, the unmistakable ding resonated, signaling the imminent closure of the doors. Come on, we can make it. Harrison's voice rang out. Responding to his call, Harrison and Grant sprinted back out of the subway car, their feet pounding against the platform as they raced towards the next car. With split-second timing, they hurled themselves inside, just as the doors began to slide shut. Their hurried entry left them off balance, their bodies hitting the ground with a jolt as they struggled to regain their footing. Harrison bore the brunt of the impact, with Grant tumbling off to the side in a scramble to right himself. Before they could fully assess their condition, the telltale sounds of moaning and shuffling footsteps reached their ears from the front of the train. They looked up to see three creatures hurtling towards them. In a desperate bid for survival, both men sprang into action, wedging themselves into the corner of the car as the first creature closed in. Grant positioned himself in the forefront, crouching slightly to gain leverage as he grappled with the approaching ghoul, holding it at bay. However, their respite was short-lived as the other two creatures surged forward, overwhelming Grant's hold on the lead ghoul. With a forceful shove, they propelled the struggling creature towards Grant, who strained against the pressure, fighting to prevent the ghoul from getting within biting distance. Meanwhile, Harrison, his arm pinned against the wall, summoned a surge of primal strength, emitting a guttural scream as he fought to free himself. He managed to wrest his arm free, grasping the scissors tightly in his hand. Without hesitation, Harrison launched into a frenzied assault, stabbing wildly at the creature's head. Each blow landed with varying degrees of impact until finally, with a decisive strike, the scissors found their mark, piercing through the zombie's eye with lethal precision. With the creature now limp but still held aloft by Grant's grip, they found themselves in a tense standoff, locked in a precarious stalemate. Grant strained to maintain his hold, keeping the other two creatures at bay, while Harrison lacked the reach to strike again with the scissors. As the moments stretched on, tension thickened in the air, both sides locked in a struggle for dominance, yet neither gaining the upper hand. What the hell do we do, man? Grant yelled out. Harrison paused, considering their options before a determined resolve settled over him. When I say so, you push with everything you have, Harrison instructed. Break to the left and get that one pin down, and I'll handle the other one. 
Damn it. Okay, let's do it. Grant responded. Harrison and Grant braced themselves for the decisive moment. With a primal scream, they lunged forward, pushing their way out of the corner with all their might. Grant utilized the corpse of the zombie he held to drive back the creature on the left, creating an opening for Harrison to maneuver around and seize the creature on the right by the arm. With a swift motion, Harrison flung the creature towards the door, creating distance between N and Grant. Meanwhile, Grant capitalized on the momentum, leveraging the weight of the dead ghoul to shove back the creature that threatened to overwhelm him. With a powerful push, he forced the creature into one of the seats, causing it to stumble and fall to the ground. Seizing the opportunity, Grant pressed down with all his strength, pinning the creature in place as he glanced back to Harrison, who was engaged in a fierce struggle with the other zombie. With the scissors poised as the creature charged towards him, Harrison braced himself for the inevitable collision. As the ghoul barreled towards him, it unexpectedly impaled itself on the makeshift weapon, the tip piercing through its eye. However, the force of the impact knocked Harrison off his feet, sending him crashing to the ground. In the chaotic aftermath, Harrison frantically searched for the scissors amidst the flurry of motion, his panicked movements fueled by adrenaline. The ghoul collapsed atop him, adding to his disorientation and panic. After what felt like an eternity, Harrison's senses gradually returned, and he realized that the creature lay motionless atop him. With a surge of relief, he threw the ghoul off, flipping over to confirm the kill shot through its eye. Stunned but alive, Harrison took a moment to collect himself, breathing a sigh of relief as he processed the situation. However, his respite was short-lived as Grant's call for assistance snapped him back to reality. Can I get a little help over here? Grant yelled out. Harrison sprang into action, retrieving the scissors from the dead ghoul's head before swiftly making his way over to Grant, who was grappling with the thrashing creature. Grant strained against the creature's struggles, utilizing every ounce of his strength to keep it pinned to the ground. Harrison approached, taking a moment to position himself for the decisive blow. With a swift and forceful stab, he delivered the kill shot, silencing the zombies thrashing once and for all. Even as the creature lay still beneath them, Grant remained atop, his vigilance unwavering as he ensured the threat was truly neutralized. Sensing his companion's need for reassurance, Harrison offered a comforting pat on the back, urging Grant to release his hold. You're good, Grant, Harrison reassured, his voice steady. They aren't getting back up. Grant nodded appreciatively as Harrison helped him to his feet, both men sharing a moment of relief and camaraderie as they let out a laugh to break the tension. That was stupid as hell, you know that, right? Grant remarked, his tone laced with a mixture of incredulity and amusement. It's only stupid if it doesn't work. And we're both still standing, Harrison retorted. It was still stupid as hell, Grant reiterated, though his laughter betrayed a sense of admiration for their audacious feat. As the laughter subsided, both men grappled with the reality of their actions, the weight of their survival settling in. Harrison broke the moment by playfully smacking Grant on the arm. Come on, let's see what we're dealing with, Harrison suggested. How close are we to the front? Grant inquired. We should have two more cars, Harrison responded, his eyes scanning the interior of the train as they approached the door. Peering through the door into the next car, they spotted a trio of zombies, their presence yet undetected thanks to the noise of the train. Harrison tapped Grant's arm, signaling for them to take cover out of sight. How much time do we have? Grant questioned. Half an hour, give or take, Harrison replied. Good, so a minute to catch our breath isn't going to matter, Grant reasoned. Can't be much more than that, though, Harrison agreed. So how in the hell are we pulling this off? Grant asked. I have ideas, but none of them are particularly good, Harrison admitted with a sigh. That hasn't stopped you so far, Grant quipped, injecting a note of levity into the tense atmosphere. Harrison chuckled, appreciating the humor before refocusing on the task at hand. Using the body as a barricade seemed to work well. We could do that again, Harrison suggested. Grant considered the proposal for a moment before nodding in agreement. It does offer a little more protection than just the briefcase. I'm going to stretch this time, though, because my arms are burning. Well, do what you need to do because we're on the clock, 
Harrison said. Grant nodded before rising to stretch his sore muscles, eventually signaling his readiness with a thumbs up. Are you ready? Harrison inquired. Not in the slightest, Grant admitted with a wry grin. Good, come on, I'll help you get the body into position, Harrison replied. With a shared chuckle, the two men set off towards the back of the train car, ready to confront the looming threat head-on. Chapter 5 Fran's urgency pierced the air as she demanded, Let me see your arm. Let me see your arm. Austin, seated nearby, clenched his arm tightly, blood seeping between his fingers as he emitted a pained grunt. It will be fine, Austin reassured, though Fran persisted, insisting, Just let me see it. Reluctantly, Austin released his grip, allowing Fran to scrutinize the injury. Her expression contorted with distress upon witnessing the extent of the wound, a sizable portion of flesh torn from his forearm. Despite his attempt to mask his discomfort with a brave facade, Austin avoided glancing at the injury. How bad does it look? He inquired, seeking Fran's assessment. Brianne deliberated briefly before responding, carefully selecting her words. Well, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty confident in saying that whoever had to patch you up would definitely be telling this story to their co-workers on their lunch break. Austin managed a strained chuckle, shaking his head in disbelief. Meanwhile, Fran turned her attention to Eden, seated nearby with her knees drawn up to her chin, visibly distressed by the morning's events. Eden, do you have anything I can bandage this up with? Fran queried. Initially unresponsive, Eden was roused by Fran's insistence. She moved towards her purse, hanging on the door between the train cars, but hesitated as she approached, observing a cluster of creatures pressed against the window. Collecting herself, Eden retrieved a colorful scarf from her purse and presented it to Fran. Will this work, Fran? She asked. Fran accepted the scarf with gratitude, nodding in affirmation. She offered Eden a warm pat on the arm. This will work great, Eden. Thank you. Eden reciprocated the nod before retreating to her seat, determined to avoid slipping back into her catatonic state. Fran, preparing to tend to Austin's wound, cautioned, this is going to sting a bit. But before Fran could proceed, Austin interjected, his concern redirected. Before you do that, hang on a minute. Where's my briefcase? Fran scanned the area and located it on the ground, promptly retrieving it for him. Austin pulled out a flask from the briefcase, prompting Fran's playful accusation. Have you been holding out on me, Austin? Austin chuckled, explaining, I was saving it for the end of the day, but at the rate things are going, I might be getting close to it. He extended the flask towards Fran, inviting her to open it. However, Fran hesitated, declining his offer despite the circumstances. I appreciate the offer, but even with what's going on, it's still a little too early in the morning for me. I was hoping that you would pour it on my wound. It's whiskey, so it should help clean it out a bit. I would do it myself, but I know it's going to burn like a son of a bitch, and we don't have time for me to be hesitating. Austin replied. Fran accepted the flask, meeting Austin's gaze with determination. Okay, we're going to go on three. One. Fran poured the whiskey onto his wound as she gripped his arm firmly, ensuring he didn't recoil. A sharp groan escaped Austin's lips as the liquid seared his injury. You're good. You're good, Fran reassured him, her voice steady. Austin took a deep breath, nodding in acknowledgement. As the initial wave of pain subsided, Fran proceeded to tightly wrap the scarf around his wound. Once secure, she offered a comforting pat on his arm. There you go, good as new. I appreciate it, Austin murmured gratefully. Silence enveloped the group as they processed the events of the day. A minute passed before Eden broke the silence, her voice trembling with uncertainty. Do either of you know if we go above ground before we get to the next stop? I wanted to call my mom again, just in case she's okay. Fran and Austin exchanged a somber glance, aware of the grim reality awaiting Eden. Yet neither could bring themselves to shatter her hope. We should be getting to an above ground area in a few minutes. Austin replied gently. Eden responded with a slow nod before retreating back into her near catatonic state. Fran gently tapped Austin on his uninjured arm, silently signaling for him to follow her. They moved to the front of the train car, giving Eden the space she needed and affording them the privacy to converse out of earshot. 
Along the way, they navigated around several zombie corpses left behind from the previous stop. What are we going to do with her? Fran inquired. Just leave her be for the time being, Austin suggested. Yeah, I know that. But what are we going to do when we stop and have to make a run for it? I mean, look at her. Does she look like someone who is going to survive out there without being watched after? Fran voiced her apprehension, gesturing towards Eden. Austin pondered the question, glancing back at the young woman before looking down at his injured arm. He nodded to himself before offering a tentative solution. I'll do what I can to watch after her. Don't be a fool, Austin. The only thing that's going to do is kill you too, Fran admonished. Austin raised his wounded arm, pointing to it as he reasoned, For all we know, I'm already dead. You saw what happened when that thing bit that woman. Yeah, but she died. You just have a bum arm. So suck it up and think about surviving, Fran retorted firmly. It's going to be hard enough out there without having a suicidal businessman keeping watch over a girl who isn't going to walk unless someone tells her to. Now if push comes to shove, we may have to leave her behind, Fran asserted. Austin regarded Fran with a serious expression, a hint of disappointment evident in his eyes. Do you hear yourself? Yeah, I do, and believe me, I'm not proud of it. However, I really want to survive today, so I'm going to have to do what I have to do, Fran conceded. Austin mulled over Fran's determination, searching for words to sway her, but her resolve was unyielding. He recognized the fierce look in her eyes, understanding that his arguments would likely fall on deaf ears. Before he could respond, sunlight flooded into the train car as they emerged above ground. Abandoning their conversation, they hurried to the windows, compelled by the sight outside. Mother of God, Fran uttered. Austin and Fran refrained from reaching for their cell phones the situation outside rendered such communication futile. Smoke plumes billowed in the distance, signaling a city engulfed in chaos. Despite the train's speed, they could discern the streets teeming with zombies, their frantic movements indicative of the perilous situation below. If I'm being honest, I'm starting to think that no matter where we go, it's not going to make a lick of difference, Austin confessed, his tone heavy with resignation. Don't be giving up on me that easy, Austin, Fran countered. Austin gestured towards the chaotic scene outside. How are we supposed to survive that? We can barely handle a few of those things in a bottleneck. What in the hell are we going to do when they're coming at us from every direction? We're going to run like hell and fight as hard as we can, Fran asserted. Good luck with that. Austin replied, a hint of defeat in his words. Before Fran could respond, they were interrupted by Eden's distraught cries directed at her phone. Pick up the phone, Mama. Pick it up. Please be okay. I know you're okay, just please pick up the phone, Eden pleaded, her voice trembling with emotion. As tears streamed down her cheeks, she dropped the phone onto the seat in front of her. Fran glanced at Austin, who nodded in acknowledgement. Yeah, I know, I'll go talk to her. If you go over there, you may throw her out of the train, Austin remarked dryly. And give up a human shield. Never, Fran retorted with a hint of sarcasm, though a kernel of truth lingered in her words. Regardless, Austin brushed off her comment and approached the sobbing young woman. Are you doing okay, Eden? Austin inquired gently. Eden continued to sob for a few moments before lifting her head to respond. My mom won't answer her phone. I need to get home to her. We're going to try, I promise, Austin assured her, though he knew it was a lie meant to provide comfort. No, we're not. We're running. But I appreciate you telling me what I want to hear, Eden replied somberly. As Eden struggled to compose herself, she confided, I know my mother is gone. I just don't want to believe it. She was there just a few hours ago, full of life. Yeah, she was sick, but we've all been sick, right? Austin empathized with her pain. I know it's hard, Eden. I lost my mother years ago to cancer. One day she was there, and the next she wasn't. It took me a while to come to terms with it, but I got over it eventually. Eden nodded. Thank you. And I know if I could talk to my mother, she'd tell me to get someplace safe and not worry about her. Then that's exactly what we're going to do, Austin affirmed. Eden gazed out over Queens, 
taking in the same harrowing sights that had left Austin and Fran shaken earlier. She shook her head in disbelief. What is happening out there? I just don't understand, Eden murmured. I don't know, Eden. All I know is that we're going to do everything we can to get as far away from it as possible, Austin reassured her. Do you think the boys are okay? I mean, do you think they made it to the front of the train? Eden inquired anxiously. I'm sure they're fine, Eden. Those boys are tough as hell, so I'm sure they put a hurting on those things, Austin replied confidently. What if they can't stop the train? Eden pressed. They will. But even if they don't, we're going to be okay. We'll just have to push a few of those people out of the way to get where we're going. I've lived in this town long enough to know how to get where I'm going in a crowd, Austin assured her. Eden's demeanor softened as she mustered a small smile, her focus shifting towards the task ahead. Austin offered her a reassuring pat on the hand before returning to Fran, who remained fixated on the chaos outside. You know, we have a few more minutes of daylight. Do you think we should call 911? Fran suggested. Austin chuckled, patting Fran on the back. Thanks, I needed a good laugh, and that joke did the trick. Fran pondered for a moment before joining in on the laughter. How do you think the boys are doing? Fran inquired. If I had to bet, I'd say that they were taking the fight to them, Austin replied. Chapter 6 Die, Die, Die Harrison's scream sliced through the air like a knife as he relentlessly thrust the scissors into the zombie's skull, each stab punctuated by a guttural cry. Grant, positioned beneath him, clung tightly to the undead body they were using as a barricade against the onslaught. With a final, decisive thrust, Harrison's assault found its mark, the scissors tip penetrating the eye socket and embedding itself in the creature's brain. As the zombie collapsed, toppling onto a heap of its brethren, Harrison and Grant released a collective sigh of relief. They remained poised, muscles tense, for a moment longer before finally allowing themselves to relax. Grant, feeling a surge of adrenaline, delivered a swift kick to the fallen horde, ensuring their demise beyond any doubt. Satisfied that the threat had been neutralized, Grant let go of the makeshift shield he'd been holding and let out a weary groan, massaging his aching arms. I must be in my own personal hell, he muttered. What makes you say that? Harrison inquired. Because I'm being punished for refusing to go to the gym, Grant replied wryly. Grant stepped aside, allowing Harrison to proceed into the next train car. Negotiating the obstacles of the fallen corpses, Harrison bent down to retrieve his scissors from the zombie's skull, but his optimism soured as he realized they had broken off inside. Well, that's not ideal, he remarked, displaying the damaged weapon to Grant before discarding it on the blood-stained floor. The good news is, there's only one more car to get through. Maybe we'll get lucky, Grant offered. Yeah, because there's a lot of that going around today, Harrison retorted dryly. The pair approached the final train car, which housed the control room. Peering inside, they spotted two zombies spaced some distance apart. One lurked near the door, while the other seemed preoccupied at the far end of the carriage. Stepping aside to confer, the two men weighed their options. So close yet so far away. And we're out of weapons, unless you count the briefcase. So how do you want to play it? Grant asked. Harrison pondered their limited options, recognizing the imminent danger if they were to simply open the door. With the zombie at the far end of the car likely to close in swiftly, fighting them off at the door with no scissors was a bad idea. His gaze drifted to the side of the train as they re-entered the tunnel, a glimmer of inspiration flickering across his face. Grant's inquiry broke his reverie. You have an idea? Grant asked. Yeah. Let me see the briefcase, Harrison replied confidently. Grant relinquished the briefcase, observing intently as Harrison approached the window. Harrison struck the corner of the briefcase against the glass until it shattered, the sound echoing through the tunnel as the window plummeted to the ground below. Confusion clouded Grant's expression as he watched Harrison's actions unfold. We're going to take them out one at a time. As soon as that door opens, that thing is going to run through. So we get it in here, slam the door shut behind it, and... Harrison trailed off, gesturing toward the now-open window. 
It took a moment for Grant to grasp his plan, but comprehension dawned, and he nodded in agreement. You're crazy, but I kind of like it, Grant remarked with a hint of admiration. Okay, do you want to man the door, or do you want to catch? Harrison inquired. I'll catch, Grant decided. Harrison positioned himself by the door, stealing his nerves for the impending confrontation, while Grant moved down the aisle, preparing to execute their plan. Grant's thumbs up signaled readiness, and Harrison reciprocated before pulling the door open. In a flash, the zombie lunged through the doorway, fixating on Grant with predatory intent. Grant met the oncoming threat head-on, emitting a primal yell as he charged toward the undead assailant. Their collision reverberated through the train car as Grant executed a swift maneuver, driving his shoulder into the zombie's midsection and leveraging its momentum to send it crashing to the floor. Seizing the opportunity, Harrison swiftly secured the door, effectively trapping the creature inside. Rushing to help Grant, he positioned himself opposite the fallen ghoul, poised for their next move. As the zombie struggled to its feet, Harrison grabbed hold of its shirt, wrenching it backward in an effort to restrain its movements. The creature thrashed and struggled against Harrison's grip, its gaze fixed unwaveringly on Grant, who maintained his position, determined to keep the zombie's attention focused squarely on him. Struggling against the thrashing zombie, Harrison gradually maneuvered it toward the front of the train car, determination etched on his face as he fought to control the creature's erratic movements. Grant joined him, adding his strength to the effort, and with a shared nod, they prepared for the decisive push. With synchronized effort, Harrison and Grant surged forward, their combined force propelling the zombie headfirst through the open window. The creature flailed wildly as it hurtled through the air, its skull meeting the unforgiving wall with a sickening thud. Convulsions racked its body as bone grated against metal, shaving away its skull until only a grotesque remnant remained. With a sense of grim satisfaction, Harrison and Grant retrieved the mutilated zombie from the exterior of the train, dropping it unceremoniously to the floor of the car. They surveyed their handiwork briefly before sharing a triumphant fist bump. Okay, one down, one to go. Same plan? Harrison proposed. If it ain't broke, Grant agreed. Let's get into position, Harrison declared. Harrison and Grant assumed their positions by the door, poised for the final confrontation. Despite the earlier commotion, the remaining zombie remained oblivious, fixated on something outside the window of the next car. Harrison swung the door open, but the creature remained unresponsive. A sharp whistle pierced the air, breaking through the zombie's trance-like state and drawing its attention. With a guttural moan, the zombie charged down the aisle toward them, its heavy footsteps reverberating through the train despite the cacophony of noise surrounding them. Harrison sidestepped, strategically positioning himself to the side, while Grant stood firm in the center of the creature's path. As the zombie barreled through the doorway, Harrison extended his leg, expertly tripping the ghoul. With a thunderous crash, the zombie careened to the ground, its momentum carrying it forward until it collided face first with the floor. Grant swiftly pounced on top of the fallen creature, effectively pinning it to the ground before it could regain its footing. Harrison wasted no time in springing into action, vaulting over the seats to reach the other side of the train car. He unleashed a barrage of stomps upon the zombie's skull, each blow resonating with a sickening crunch until the creature lay motionless beneath him. After a moment's pause to catch their breath, Harrison and Grant surveyed the aftermath, relieved to find no further threats lurking in the train car. Their path to the front control room lay unobstructed. Hang on a second, Harrison interjected abruptly, breaking the silence. He strode purposefully to the rear of the car, retrieving the bloodied scissor fragment before wiping it clean on the slain zombie. What the hell is that for? Grant queried, confusion etched upon his features. I can't imagine they just leave these doors unlocked, Harrison replied. Grant considered the implication for a moment before nodding in understanding. Better get a move on then. I can't imagine we have too much time left before the next stop, he urged, his sense of urgency palpable. Glancing down at his watch, Harrison grimaced as he noted the time. Nine minutes and change. Come on. The two men dashed to the front of the next car, coming to a halt beside a small door leading into the control room. Harrison attempted to twist the handle, but it remained stubbornly locked. 
I figured it was worth a shot, he remarked with a shrug, before attempting to manipulate the broken blade into the door's locking mechanism. Despite his efforts, the door remained unyielding. Do you know what you're doing? Grant inquired. Can't say that I do, actually. I don't have a lot of experience with breaking and entering, Harrison admitted with a wry grin. Grant motioned for the scissors, and Harrison passed them over. With practice precision, Grant positioned the scissors, and within moments, the door clicked open. How the hell did you do that? Harrison marveled. My ex loved to lock me out of the apartment after a fight. So I learned a few things because I didn't want to sleep in the hallway, Grant explained with a smirk. Harrison chuckled, giving Grant a playful smack on the chest before stepping into the cramped control booth. Grant lingered in the doorway, giving him space to work. Inside, Harrison surveyed the control panel, familiarizing himself with the various switches and monitors. Meanwhile, Grant's attention was drawn to the monitors lining the wall, providing a comprehensive view of each train car. Holy shit! They're still kicking, Grant exclaimed. All of them? Harrison inquired. Grant's confirmation brought a sense of relief to Harrison, but their focus quickly shifted to the task at hand. Well, let's see if we can keep it that way, Harrison declared resolutely as he reached for the throttle control. However, his attempt to slow the train yielded no results, sending a ripple of fear through both men. What the hell? Why is this not working? Harrison exclaimed, his frustration mounting as he grappled with the unresponsive controls. Grant's eyes darted to the control board, spotting the illuminated red light beside the word automated. The automation is still on, he realized, his voice tinged with urgency. Harrison frantically searched for a means to disable the automation, his agitation growing palpable. Failing to locate a solution, he slammed his hand down on the console in frustration. Damn it. Harrison cursed, his gaze darting to his watch, which displayed the dwindling time before their next stop. Spotting the intercom, he seized it, activating the communication channel with a click. I hope that you guys can hear me back there. We made it to the control room, but it's still stuck on automated control. We don't have a way to stop the train, and we're going to be at the next station in a couple of minutes. Harrison took a brief moment to collect his thoughts, his attention drawn to the monitor displaying Fran's agitated pacing. Although he couldn't hear her, her frenzied movements spoke volumes. Don't panic, we're doing what we can up here, Harrison reassured into the intercom before setting it down, exchanging a tense glance with Grant. Okay, I think it's time to panic, he conceded. Grant's eyes fell upon a knob on the intercom. Flip the knob to dispatch, maybe they can help, he proposed. Following Grant's suggestion, Harrison adjusted the knob and pressed the button once more. Hello, is there anybody there? We're in desperate need of help and need it fast, Harrison implored. A prolonged silence ensued, prompting Harrison to press the button again, his desperation mounting. Please, for the love of God, we need help. Is there anybody there? He pleaded, his voice ringing out into the void. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, a woman's voice crackled through the intercom. This is dispatch. Now who in the hell is this? Chapter 7 Harrison and Grant exchanged a glance brimming with urgency as they listened intently to the voice on the other end of the line. Fumbling momentarily, Harrison pressed the button again, his fingers tense with apprehension. Please, we need help, he implored. We're on the Queen's Express headed towards Manhattan. We're just a couple of minutes away from the river stop, and if we can't override the automated system, a lot of people are going to die. Okay, calm down now, let's see what we can do. The dispatcher responded calmly. What's your name? I'm Harrison, he replied. Okay, Harrison, I need you to find the accelerator lever. Do you see it? The dispatcher instructed. Yeah, I tried that already. It didn't work. We're on an automated train, Harrison explained with frustration. There was a prolonged silence, during which the dispatcher remained silent. Hello? Did you hear me? Harrison prompted. I heard you, Harrison. You're going to have to give me a minute. The dispatcher replied. We don't have a minute. We have two minutes before we hit that station. 
And if it's anything like the others, there's going to be a lot of dead people on this train, Harrison stressed. Okay, okay, look, I'm going to do what I can. But it takes an act of God to disable the automated system, unless you're a supervisor, the dispatcher admitted. I'm guessing it's too much to hope that a supervisor is around, Harrison questioned. They didn't make it in this morning, the dispatcher confirmed. I'm pretty sure that wasn't their fault, but it doesn't do much to help us right now, Harrison muttered, his frustration mounting. Let me think, let me think, what can we do? The dispatcher muttered to herself. We need to remove the automation, Harrison suggested desperately. That's not going to happen in the next two minutes, so we better start thinking of something else. The dispatcher retorted urgently. What else can help? Harrison inquired. Harrison glanced up at Grant, who pondered the situation for a moment before his face lit up with excitement, nodding in agreement. We need a door override. Stopping isn't the problem, it's the doors opening so those things can get in here, Grant exclaimed. That's it. Harrison exclaimed. Without hesitation, Harrison pressed the button on the receiver once more. Forget trying to stop this thing, we just need to make sure that the doors don't open. He relayed urgently. I think I can work with that. Give me a minute, the dispatcher responded. Harrison and Grant peered out of the front window, the lights from the platform growing closer with each passing moment. Harrison checked his watch realizing they had less than a minute before their impending arrival. We're going to be cutting this close, he remarked. Grant scanned the cramped room, quickly strategizing. He stepped onto the seat Harrison occupied, hunching over to place his other foot at the top of the control panel. What the hell are you doing, man? Your crotch is right in my face, Harrison protested, bewildered by Grant's actions. If we can't keep those doors shut, I'm going to want to be in here with you, Grant explained. Harrison paused for a moment, realizing Grant was right, before nodding in agreement. He grabbed the door to the control room, slamming it shut and securing it tightly. As they settled into their positions, the dispatcher's voice crackled through the receiver once more. Okay, this isn't going to be easy, but it can be done, the dispatcher informed them. Just tell me what I need to do, Harrison demanded. Okay, to the right of the control panel, there should be a small panel that reads manual release. Do you see it? The dispatcher instructed. Harrison strained to contort his body, finally spotting the panel towards the lower portion. Yeah, I got it. He confirmed. Open it up. The dispatcher ordered. Harrison reached down, his fingers scrambling to grasp the small screw tab at the top of the panel. With the train beginning to slow down, he intensified his efforts the urgency driving him forward. After a struggle, he managed to pry off the panel, the metal clattering to the floor. Peering inside, he discovered a crank. Before he could fully comprehend its function, the train pulled into the station, the warning ding echoing throughout the carriage. In a moment of terror, Harrison watched as the crank spun around, synchronizing with the opening of the train doors. Oh my God, he exclaimed. Grant glanced out the window, his eyes widening in horror as he saw the platform swarming with zombies. Get it closed. Get it closed. Grant urged urgently. Harrison dropped the receiver, grappling with the crank to turn it in the right direction. After a tense struggle, Grant observed on the monitors that the doors were beginning to close, although his angle prevented him from seeing the other survivors. Harrison fought against the resistance, pushing the crank about halfway closed. When it refused to budge any further, he seized the receiver, his voice strained with frustration. Why won't this thing shut all the way? He demanded. Something must be caught in the doorway. That manual release doesn't have a safety, so you're just going to have to put some muscle behind it, and it'll close up, the dispatcher explained. Summoning his resolve, Harrison took a deep breath before repositioning himself to grip the crank with both hands. With a forceful grunt, he exerted all his strength turning the crank as quickly as he could. Come on, come on, get there, he urged. After a moment of intense struggle, the crank finally yielded to his efforts. Harrison felt a surge of relief wash over him as it stopped moving. Moments later, the familiar ding echoed throughout the train, 
signaling its resumption of movement. It worked. It worked. Harrison exclaimed. Good, I'm glad you're safe. What about everybody else? The dispatcher inquired. Give me a second. Let me check the monitors, Harrison replied. Grant shifted his position to allow Harrison to peer through his legs at the monitor. It took him a moment to locate the right display, and when he did, he froze in shock. Grant glanced down, his own expression mirroring Harrison's growing dread. How bad is it? Grant asked softly, his voice filled with apprehension. They're just. Harrison trailed off, his voice catching in his throat as he struggled to find the words. They're just gone, he finally managed to say. Grant shook his head in disbelief, twisting his body to peer through his own legs at the monitors. After a moment, he located the right display and let out a defeated sigh. Instead of the three survivors recovering from another skirmish, the monitor revealed a chilling sight at least ten of those creatures crowded the car. Acts of them were engaged in a frenzied struggle over something on the floor, and it didn't take long for Grant to realize they were fighting over food. Exchanging a glance filled with resignation, Harrison and Grant's hearts sank further as they heard banging on the door to the control room. Harrison glanced over, double-checking to ensure the door remained securely locked. I'm back, dispatch, Harrison spoke into the receiver, his voice heavy with defeat. I'm afraid that we didn't catch it in time. They're all gone. I am so sorry. I really am. I wish I could have done something more, but I just... I just... I tried, the dispatcher's voice crackled with regret. It's okay, it's not your fault. We didn't really give you a lot of time to help us out, Harrison reassured her. We. I thought you said everybody was gone? The dispatcher inquired. I'm sorry, everybody in the other train car is gone. My friend Grant is crammed inside the control room with me, Harrison explained. Hello, Grant added, his voice muffled from his awkward position. They can't be comfortable, the dispatcher remarked sympathetically. It really isn't, Grant confirmed wryly. But it's a lot more comfortable than being back there with those things, which we're going to be stuck with here soon if we don't figure something out. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have 15 minutes before we hit the final stop, right? Harrison interjected. The dispatcher's voice crackled through the receiver, followed by a long pause as she murmured to herself, the weight of the situation evident in her tone. Yeah, Harrison, that's right. You're going to be going underneath the water, then hit the station in about 15 minutes. Which means you boys need to decide on what you're going to do. She finally responded, her voice tinged with urgency. Our original plan was to stop it underneath the water in the tunnel and get up to Roosevelt Island through the escape tunnel. I'm guessing that's not going to be an option. Harrison questioned. Even if I was able to figure out a way to stop that train, I want you to look out the window to your right and tell me what you see, the dispatcher instructed. Harrison and Grant complied, their hearts sinking as they saw the wall looming close to them, reminiscent of the one they had dispatched a zombie with. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that the wall runs the entire length of the tunnel, Harrison remarked dryly. It does for the majority of it. There are some access points where the walls move back some, but I couldn't tell you where in the hell they are. Plus, there's another problem, the dispatcher revealed. Of course there is, Harrison muttered. You're on an automated line, and you're not the only train that's running on that track. So if you stop underneath there, 30 minutes from now, there would be a crash. And that would be bad, the dispatcher explained. How much time would we have to get away from the train? Harrison inquired. I don't mean to burst your little bubble there, Harrison, but this is New York City, and more than a few people live here. Do you think you're the only one stuck on a train this morning? The dispatcher countered. Harrison and Grant exchanged a defeated look, their shoulders slumping in agreement. That's a fair point. I'll be honest with you, we're kind of open to suggestions at this point. Just keep in mind that we aren't going to be able to get out into the train car, so whatever the plan is, it's going to have to involve going out the window here. Harrison explained, his voice resigned. I can't tell you what to do because it's your ass on the line and not mine. But when that train stops at the next station, it's there for three minutes before taking off, so you'll have a little extra time to get someplace safe, the dispatcher advised, her tone serious. 
What about riding back to Queens? Harrison proposed. You can certainly do that and try to get back home if you can. But there ain't nothing good happening out there, and it's only getting worse. You'll have at least an hour of travel time, the dispatcher warned. Harrison glanced up at Grant for his opinion. I'm following your lead, man. I think we're screwed no matter what we do, and I'd rather die knowing I wasn't the one who picked the wrong option. Grant quipped, a faint smile crossing his lips, as they shared a moment of dark humor. Hey, dispatch, if we get off in Manhattan, where would we go? Harrison inquired. Give me just a second. Let me see what track you're coming in on. The dispatcher replied after a brief pause. Okay, you're going to be coming in on the inner track. So do you want the good news or bad news first? She asked. Hit us with the bad news, Harrison requested. It means you're going to be right up against the main platform, and there's usually a ton of people up there, the dispatcher explained. Fantastic. And the good news? Harrison inquired. You're close to the emergency stairs up to the surface. It's about 300 yards down the line, and it'll take you up top, the dispatcher revealed. Any idea where? Harrison pressed further. Just up from the station, so about five blocks away from the river, the dispatcher replied. Harrison turned to Grant, five block sprint. You up for it, or do you want to head back to Queens, he asked. You've been all about the water all morning. So let's go for it, Grant replied, his resolve matching Harrison's. Okay, dispatch, we're going to make our play in Manhattan. Thank you for all your help, Harrison informed the dispatcher. It's my pleasure, Harrison. I really wish I could have been more help. Good luck out there, the dispatcher responded earnestly. Thanks, dispatch. You too, Harrison replied before tossing the receiver down. He rubbed his head wearily, letting out a deep sigh as he glanced down at his watch. Six minutes, until we're running for our lives. Chapter 8 Harrison and Grant sat in silence within the control room of the subway train, hurtling down the tracks towards the main station platform. Harrison stole glances at his watch, mentally counting down the minutes until their inevitable departure. The only other sound besides the rhythmic clatter of the train was the incessant moaning and banging on the door from the zombies outside. Though they tried to drown out the noise, their attention remained fixed on the impending challenge ahead. How much time do we have? Grant inquired, breaking the tense silence. Two minutes, give or take, Harrison replied. You know this is likely it, right? Grant observed solemnly. I'm trying not to think about it, but yeah. If I was still a gambler, I'd definitely put my money on the field, Harrison admitted, a wry smile tugging at the corners of his lips. Grant chuckled, his laughter cutting through the tension in the air. What's so funny? Harrison asked. I just think it's humorous that someone who ran into battle against a small army with nothing more than a pair of scissors and an unathletic partner wielding a briefcase, and somehow survived, isn't a gambler. If I thought we had time on our way to the river, I was going to suggest we stop by a bodega so you can buy me some lottery tickets, Grant explained. Both men erupted into laughter, their voices echoing in the cramped confines of the control room as they sought to alleviate the tension hanging over them. Yeah, with my luck, I'd win it today and have no way to cash it in, Harrison quipped. As the train began to decelerate, their laughter faded, replaced by an intense focus. Okay, here we go. As soon as we stop, we get down to the ground as quietly as we can, then move silently until it's time to run, Harrison instructed, his voice low and serious. I can work with that, Grant affirmed. The tension in the control room escalated as Harrison and Grant stared intently out the front window, their breaths held as they approached the platform. Their anticipation turned to horror as they beheld the scene before them a horde of hundreds of creatures milling about, some drawn by the noise of the approaching train. An audible gasp escaped their lips as four of the creatures stumbled off the platform, their clumsy movements causing them to faceplant on the ground before scrambling back up and charging straight for the train. Harrison and Grant winced as the zombies were obliterated upon impact with the front of the train. I'm starting to think these things aren't all that bright, Grant remarked. If we live long enough, we'll have to remember that, Harrison replied grimly. 
Both men remained as still as possible, praying that none of the creatures would notice their presence. After what felt like an eternity, the train finally came to a stop, the familiar ding resonating throughout the carriage. Harrison gave Grant a nod, silently communicating their readiness. With careful precision, he reached over to the window, gently unlocking it and pulling it open. He stuck his head slightly out, peering back to assess the situation. With the platform teeming with activity as zombies tried to board and disembark the train, Harrison and Grant found themselves mere yards from the edge. Despite the commotion, none of the creatures paid them any attention, their focus solely on each other's movements and sounds. Harrison glanced up at Grant, silently signaling his intent to exit the train. With a swift motion, he threw his legs over the side, pivoting to grab onto the train's exterior before lowering himself down. Despite the stretch, he still faced a significant drop of around four feet to the ground below. As Harrison landed softly on the pavement, a faint sound emitted, causing him to freeze in place. He cast a wary glance back at the platform, relieved to find that none of the creatures had taken notice of him. Motioning for Grant to follow, he looked up, his expression urging his companion to join him. Grant hesitated for a moment before attempting to follow suit. As he began to lower himself down, his grip slipped, causing him to drop from a higher height than Harrison had. Harrison's heart sank as he witnessed Grant's fall, his attempt to catch him thwarted by his focus on the surrounding zombies. With a sickening thud, Grant hit the pavement hard, his ankle snapping under the pressure. A grunt of pain escaped Grant's lips, though he managed to stifle a full-throated scream. Acting swiftly, Harrison reached out just in time to prevent him from hitting the ground, catching him mere inches from the pavement. Their eyes met in a silent exchange of understanding before both men looked down at the gruesome injury. The bone protruded through Grant's skin, rendering the limb useless. Grant shook his head frantically, his silent plea for Harrison to leave him behind clear. But Harrison refused to entertain the thought, pulling Grant up as best as he could. He wrapped his arm around Grant's shoulders, taking on the burden of their escape. Despite Grant's efforts, he couldn't bear an ounce of weight on his broken ankle. With each step, the pain intensified, and when Harrison stumbled, forcing Grant to bear some weight, a yelp of agony escaped his lips, despite his best efforts to remain silent. As Grant's plea rang out, Harrison's heart clenched with anguish. He knew he couldn't abandon his friend, but the increasing horde of zombies rushing toward them left him with no choice. Get out of here, man. I'm screwed. Grant urged, his voice filled with desperation. Harrison hesitated, torn between his loyalty to Grant and the instinct to survive. Glancing back at the growing swarm of zombies, he knew time was running out. Go, now. Grant insisted, his voice strained with pain. I'm sorry, Grant. I really am. Harrison exclaimed, his voice choked with emotion. With a heavy heart, Harrison turned and sprinted down the tracks, his legs pumping as hard as they could. He couldn't bear to look back as he heard Grant's screams being drowned out by the sound of the advancing horde. After a hundred yards of frenzied running, Harrison risked a glance over his shoulder. A dozen or so zombies were in hot pursuit, their ghastly forms closing the distance with alarming speed. The closest one was only thirty yards behind, and Harrison could feel his strength waning. Pick it up, man, Harrison urged himself. With every fiber of his being, Harrison pushed himself to run harder, his breath coming in ragged gasps as he carefully placed each step along the side of the track, determined not to trip himself up. The next hundred yards passed in a blur, but as he stole a glance over his shoulder, he saw the mob of zombies closing in. However, his spirits lifted as he spotted the emergency exit looming ahead. Summoning the last reserves of his energy, Harrison pushed himself to run even harder knowing that freedom was within his grasp. As he reached the door, he turned the knob and pushed it open, darting inside the dimly lit room at the base of the stairs. His heart pounded in his chest as he slipped upon entry, his momentum causing him to stumble. Quickly regaining his footing, he attempted to shut the door behind him, but his efforts were thwarted by the arrival of a couple of zombies. Desperation flooded him as he struggled to slam the door shut, but it refused to close completely. Planting his feet firmly on the ground, Harrison braced himself against the onslaught of the undead, using every ounce of strength to hold the door in place. Despite the growing number of zombies pressing against the door, he found a small glimmer of hope in the fact that they were thrashing about, 
unable to coordinate their efforts to push the lead zombie into him. Harrison resolved to hold the line for as long as he could, knowing that his survival depended on it. As the standoff between Harrison and the zombies persisted, the sound of the approaching train grew louder in the distance. With a low grunt, Harrison pushed with all his might, his senses heightened as he listened intently to the train drawing nearer. Finally, the rumble of the train filled the tunnel, drowning out all other noise. Harrison braced himself as he felt the impact of numerous zombie bodies being struck by the passing train. The force of the blows disrupted the zombies' attempts to push through the door, allowing Harrison to shove it closed with all his strength. A sigh of relief escaped him as he heard the door click shut. However, his relief was short-lived when he realized there was no way to lock the door. He stared at it for a moment, pressed up against it, before stepping back cautiously, relieved to find that it remained firmly shut. Thank God it was a doorknob and not a release bar, Harrison muttered to himself. Harrison surveyed the sparse confines of the small room, realizing there was little to use for barricading the door. But he didn't dwell on it, knowing this was only a temporary refuge. With a weary resolve, he turned his attention to the stairs leading upward, each step a painful reminder of the physical toll his escape had taken on him. Conscious of the need to conserve energy for the journey ahead, he ascended slowly, his muscles protesting with each movement. After what felt like an eternity, he reached the top of the stairs, greeted by a narrow platform barely large enough to accommodate a handful of people and a couple of benches against the side wall. Spotting the door leading to the street, Harrison approached it cautiously, his mind racing with thoughts of what lay ahead. Okay, I have to get my bearings, find east, and haul ass to the river, he muttered to himself, stealing his resolve. Five blocks and you're swimming, or on a boat if you're lucky. As Harrison stood before the door, his hand hesitating over the release, fear gripped him at the thought of what awaited on the other side. It's only getting worse out there, he murmured to himself, a knot of dread tightening in his stomach, but he knew he couldn't stay hidden forever. Forcing himself to act, Harrison nodded resolutely and reached for the release bar. With a shaky breath, he pushed the door open just enough to catch a glimpse of the scene outside. What he saw was a nightmare come to life. Dozens of zombies roamed the streets, their grotesque forms darting about in search of prey. Several groups feasted on unfortunate souls lying on the ground. In the midst of the chaos, an overturned taxi lay in the middle of the street, its doors sealed shut with trapped passengers inside. One person managed to escape and began to run, only to be pursued in multiple directions by a pack of relentless zombies. Harrison watched in horror as the hapless individual was quickly overwhelmed, their desperate attempts at escape ending in a painful death after just a few short steps. With a sigh, he shut the door, having seen enough. As the creatures outside began to batter the door, Harrison found himself with no viable options and a sinking sense of despair. With a heavy heart, he retreated several steps, feeling the weight of hopelessness settling over him like a suffocating shroud. Spotting a bench nearby, Harrison made his way over and sank down onto it, the cold metal offering little comfort. Despite the dire circumstances, a bitter laugh escaped him as he reflected on his recent turn of fate. Been unemployed for three months. Three whole months of me sitting my ass on the couch. As soon as I get motivated to go get a job, the universe smacks me down, he mused bitterly, the irony not lost on him. Another hollow laugh bubbled up from within him, tinged with a sense of resignation. The cacophony of banging on the doors below and above served as a grim reminder of the imminent danger lurking just beyond reach. Well, on the plus side, three months of sitting on my ass has prepared me for this scenario, Harrison quipped darkly, his attempt at humor a feeble defense against the encroaching despair. With a defeated sigh, he kicked off his shoes and stretched out on the bench, occupying the entire space. There was nothing left to do except what he had done best in recent months. Wait. The end.